Al had a question about doing an example of, in question three, using Excel to find this correlation. Hopefully everyone can see my desktop here. And it's on the question about the census housing data, the unadjusted, adjusted. So I have the housing data here. I'm going to delete the data that you guys are actually supposed to look at. So let's just let's just keep looking at the south just because that's where I am. Let me delete these. If you're just watching this video now, I just created this T column a few seconds ago. So you can do that yourself. Uh, well, I shouldn't have done that because I need to know south. This is my not seasonally adjusted. And here's my south seasonally adjusted. And these are monthly. And I say monthly. And this is seasonally adjusted. I'll say Y for yearly or annual. Let me get rid of these other ones. And I had the issue about creating a new column of, let's see, make a new column of seasonally adjusted monthly by dividing the annual by 12. So here's my annual. So I'll make a new column. And it'll be the south still. And I'll call it seasonally adjusted monthly. And I'll do the annual divided by 12. Copy all that down. And maybe throw in some decimals so we can see what's going on better. Um, <clears throat> a, a little trick that you might not know. I don't really need this annual column here anymore. And it's, if I keep it here, knowing me, I'm probably going to refer to it by accident. So if I just say, well, okay, I've got my annual data here, but I don't need it anymore, so I'm just going to delete it. Well, it screws up my the column that I made of the monthly data because the monthly data was referring to the, that's why it has the REF error. I just assume that means it's, a, it's lost its reference or something like that. So I would like to keep all these numbers here without, and I'd still like to be able to delete this column. Well, one way I can do that is I'm fine with the values that are in this these cells now. Um, I don't want the formulas there anymore. I just want the values. So I can, if I copy the whole column, and then if I paste basically right on top of that same column, but I paste the values, or if I go to paste special, just the values. So not the actual formulas or any of the other stuff, just the actual numbers that are there. Then I hit I hit paste, and now you can see that there's no formulas there anymore. It's just the regular numbers. So now I can delete my annual column, and I don't get that reference error anymore. Then we're trying to figure out how to get Excel to do this correlation between the unadjusted and the adjusted monthly data. Uh, I mentioned where the file comes from in the first part up here. There's the, uh, in your book, you'll see there's a reference to the, there's a reference to the census page where they got it, census, census.gov slash new home sales. And I kind of mentioned how to get there, how to get that Excel file from that page trying to figure out the correlation between those two. So I have, I have these sales here in my column B now that are not seasonally adjusted and I have the, and they're in monthly terms <clears throat> and I've sort of generated a monthly data series for the same region, the south, but these are supposed to, these are seasonally adjusted, at least the annual data was seasonally adjusted and so then I divided this by 12. So basically the only difference that should show up between these two columns is a result of the seasonal adjustment that's happening. They should be fairly highly correlated, I would hope. <clears throat> the only difference would be the seasonal adjustment that they're doing. I mean, the whole point of this of this question is to see what the seasonal adjustment does, and because you've got the data itself that was seasonally adjusted, and then you have this D variable that the book is trying to get you to to make the seasonal adjustment by putting in, um, you know, a zero or a one depending on what month it is. So I want to figure out the, how this column B is correlated with this column C. Again, you can just kind of eyeball it, and they look fairly close. I mean, these are in the high 20s, and these are in the high 20s, and then these drop into the teens, and these drop into the teens. So I want to find the correlations here. Let me just delete these so I can get it out of the way. So Excel's correlation function, C-O-R-R-E-L, just like I showed in the on the Word document here, equals Corel, and then you have to put in parentheses the two columns that you want to figure out what the two arrays, as Excel calls it. So array one is just the set of data, the first set of data that you want to correlate with the second set of data. So um, I'll do Corel and I'll go to the top of my column 
and I'll select all of it. I did control shift down arrow to select all of it really fast. So again, if I look in Excel, I can see that the array one, if un under the little window that's popping up here, the array one is bolded because Excel knows that, that I'm filling out the information for what I want my array one to be. So then I'll hit comma, and now it's got the array two bolded because it says, okay, I'm ready for you to enter in the data that you want for your array two. So I'll go up to that column, the top of that column, select all of it, close off my parentheses. So I can see that it's going gonna, it's gonna to find the correlation between the cells from B9 down to B108, and it's going to correlate that with the cells C9 down to C108. So I've typed it in, so then when I come here and hit enter, it says one, but I need to give myself some more decimal places. So they're pretty highly correlated. I mean, 0.9 is pretty highly correlated. Your correlations are going to run from negative one through zero and up to one. So if you have two variables that move in opposite directions, then the correlations will be negative. If you have two variables that move in the same direction, like these do, then they'll be um, positive. And the, the closer they are to either negative one or to one, um, the stronger the correlation is. So if you had a correlation of zero, then your data is not really related to each other at all. But these are fairly highly correlated, I mean, because it's close to one, and they're, it's positive, so they're moving in the same direction. They both seem to be moving in the same direction fairly uh, closely. Determine the correlation between those two. Produce scatter plots with connectors of both. Um, but if we wanted to do the scatter plot now, it looked a little like 264, because I want to be able to look at these sales over time. So I'm going to start with June 2008 um, at the origin, and then I'm going to move forward to, we said, April 2016 on the rightmost axis. I'll highlight everything. Well, not the T's, but I'll highlight the month. And I might not like that. I don't know how it's typed in. Um, but then I'll highlight my not seasonally adjusted data and my seasonally adjusted data. So I said to do a insert. I want to insert, and I've got my little chart section of the insert tab or the insert ribbon, I think they call that. I've got my charts here, and I said to do a what? I said to do a scatter plot with connectors. So as I kind of move through here, if I leave my mouse over there for a second, it'll, it'll usually tell me. So scatter plots with straight lines. I guess they don't say connectors. When I say connectors, I, I don't want just the bare dots because I want the lines between them. Um, I, want, I want to know the relationship between January 2008 and February 2008. And sometimes if you just had dots by themselves, it might not be as clear. So basically any of the, the dots that have the, the lines in between them is fine. I mean, you don't even have to have the dots if you don't want to. So this one's fine. Uh, scatter with straight lines is fine. Let me make this big. <clears throat> from starting from scratch. I would highlight the months, and you can see I've got my months down here on my horizontal axis. So my months are going from January 2008 up to April 2016. So I highlighted that column, and I also do the you know do the uh, labels of that column too, so the row above everything, and then highlight the two columns of data that you need. Grab everything, and then insert. Go over to your charts, and then any of these really will be okay except for the the dot, just the plain dots. It's probably not going to be as make things as clear, and with as many data points as we have. If you do just the dots, it can get, uh, well, this is the same chart, but having so many dots there can make it a little messy, and the dots themselves aren't really telling you a whole lot. I mean, the lines are, are doing a pretty, are doing a good enough job. So, something sort of like this. Do you think making a seasonal adjustment will be useful given what you observe? Well, here's my, my not seasonally adjusted is my blue, and my seasonally adjusted is my red. So I don't want to answer that question because that's that's for you guys to do. The big thing that is hard to remember is to put the little comma in there. When you're done highlighting one column, you have to hit the comma and then highlight your second column. <clears throat> if you just do correlation and without hitting the comma, I don't think it's going to know it too. It's probably just going to give you an error message. If you do it without connectors, it's kind of nice because again, we're this is data that's it's got some, a time feature to it, so it's kind of nice to 
to see that, well, you know, I started January, was down here, and then it jumped up to February, and the line kind of helps me see that trend. Well, you know, when I went from January up to February, it bumped, jumped up to here, and then when I, well, actually, that was March, um, and then it fell here, and then it moved up again. If all you see are the dots, sometimes that, it's not as, it's not as obvious. Uh, let's see. I mean, it's still going to be pretty obvious, but maybe not as much. I think it just kind of makes it harder to see what's going on. And I think this, this chart with the little dots in it is a little bit harder to see um, what's going on with these two, these two variables over time. Um, kind of depends on what the reason you're making the graph. So in this situation, I think having the connectors tends to, to make it clear what's going on. Make a T2 column. So I said, because they have, if you look at their data, <clears throat> if you look at that um, chart on 264, their sales just keep tending to go up over time. And so they have a T variable in there, which just increases linearly. They have that equation back on page 262 near the top, where the quantity equals A plus B times T, which makes you think that there's this, there's this linear time trend that over time, that the sales are going to increase at sort of a linear rate. And it kind of looks like they do on the chart on page 264. Things just sort of see, seem to be increasing at a fairly linear rate. But if you look at our picture, even in this one with the south, <clears throat> I don't see that at all. I mean, it's kind of linear, maybe. You could, if you want to just to test it, you could click on one of these things and do the, have we done adding trend lines in here? I think we have. If I tried adding a, some trend lines to this data, if I said, well, throw in a linear trend line, well, it, it's going to try to do it, but this straight line here certainly doesn't do a very good job of capturing the U-shapedness. I just invented a word. The U-shapedness of this data. So just having a T variable is going, is going to create a linear time trend, but my data doesn't look linear. It looks U-shaped. So if I switch this, to a U-shaped polynomial, a polynomial of order two, that does a much better job. Well, a polynomial of order two means that you have to have a squared term in there also. So then I, I told you to make a not just a T term, but also a T squared term too. So that's going to do a lot better job of, of capturing what the data is actually doing. But to do that, again, you, just, you have your T variable here already, and you can just make a T2 equals that column squared. Just copy that all the way down. It looks pretty huge, but it's going to make your model fit a lot better. If you wanted to, if you had time, and I'm sure everyone has time to do things that aren't related to the assignment, you could go in and try running similar regressions to these, but don't include the T squared variable in there. So maybe like do run this regression number one um, seasonally unadjusted with T and T squared, and then try doing it without the T squared in there. And you're probably going to get much worse, like R squared values and things like that. Your regressions are going to have the T's in there. But I just wanted to get a picture of what's happening to the sales over time. So all I needed was a scatter plot of just, of just the sales over time. And so if, if you tried putting the T variable in there, if I went back here and I um, added like the T variable to it, my x values will be here, and my y values will be here. It's just going to give me a straight line. It's just going to show a straight line in the picture, and it's mm -hmm. not going to be very. It's not going to tell me much. I mean, it went from. I mean, I don't even know what it's doing. It's just it's all plotting it way over here. There's this green mm -hmm. line. I have no idea what that means. So, I'm just going to get rid of that. Again, the re I just had you do the scatter plot because I wanted you to to get a visual sense of what's happening to the sales as time goes on, both for the adjusted and the unadjusted columns. Doing the regressions, though, again, you're going to want to, you are going to want to include those T variables and the D variables, you know, for some, those other ones when you can. And that, I like how that, that it uses actual real data that you're going out and collecting yourself. And it's current. I mean, this is April 2016 is as current as two days ago. It's one of those where you, you could just go and blindly run these regressions and be like, okay, he's telling me to do regression one. Okay, I'll do that. Uh, he's telling me to do regression two. I'll do that. If you kind of, before you run these, if you look at it, I mean, if you, if you read how, you know, I've got, well, unadjusted data here and adjusted data here, and I've got this variable here and this other variable here. 
you should be able to come up with some sort of guess about, well, I think these results are going to look like this. I think these other results are going to probably look like this. So you should be able to kind of come up with some, some thoughts, generate some thoughts for yourself about what you think the results are going to look like before you actually run these things. Or if you don't do that, once you, once you do run those regressions and you look at the results, you should maybe after you look at them for a few minutes, you'd be like, oh, yeah, I can see why that, that variable is significant or why that other variable is insignificant because of how these, these four regressions are set up.